Hi, I am so pleased today to be talking to you about one of the workshops we conducted recently in IIT Hyderabad. It was an IPOS Academy workshop on uh, psychological distress, identifying it and providing support. And um, just a quick background, the IPOS is basically the International Psycho-Oncology Society. And alongside a lot of activities that the IPOS um, engages in, one of it is ac academic activities or events. And they provided us in-kind support and sponsorship for this uh, workshop. And that was a fantastic boost for us and also very encouraging. Um, here is just um, um, you know a glimpse at our flyer that we use to advertise about our workshop and I'll talk about the details in this uh, flyer in the next couple of slides anyway. But before I um, go on um, I'd like to also mention over here that I will be talking a little bit about uh, the workshop but I'll also be introducing some of the, the, the slides that I had presented as part of my uh, introduction um, to this workshop in, uh, in IIT Hyderabad. Now, as usual, um, I uh, was asked repeatedly by a lot of people who were interested in participating in this workshop, as well as um, people who attended the workshop asking, what's an IIT got to do with psychosocial oncology? When did this happen? And so I had put together this slide for the benefit of them, but I thought, hey, you know, if I have some new viewers, then it's also for the benefit of you. So in IIT Hyderabad, we have uh, the Department of Liberal Arts. Now from the inception of all IITs in India, um, they always had these HSS departments, which are called Humanities and Social Sciences. And while they may have started off as you know, an auxiliary or service department, now they're independent departments uh, with their own intake of master's level, uh, MPhil, and PhD students. Alongside teaching courses to undergrad BTEC students, they also teach and do a lot of research with uh, postgraduate students in specific disciplines. So the Department of Liberal, of Liberal Arts in IIT Hyderabad is a multidisciplinary department and we have um, a variety of disciplines including anthropology, cultural studies, economics, English, linguistics, psychology and sociology in our department. Uh, we are headed by Dr. Badri Narayan Rath who is an economist himself. Now when it comes to me or my team's research, we are six of us who focus specifically on psychosocial oncology within this department of liberal arts. And um, this team obviously is headed by me, but um, they're strong independent researchers and uh, it's been such a pleasure working with them. And they've all expressed interests within the field of psychosocial oncology, which is why they um, chose to work with me. Or um, as you can see with the group uh, over here, Nagesh, uh, Swati and Aishwarya, they were actually either research associates or uh, interns with me and we all worked within uh, the main areas of um, psychosocial oncology which interests me and this team is pathways to care, medical communication and satisfaction, cancer beliefs, labeling, a whole host of topics on doctor-patient interaction, relationship, communication, whatever you want to call it. Physician burnout is something that we're recently looking at. Supportive care needs is something that we're looking at with the team in Hong Kong. End-of-life issues, survivorship and cultural context of care is like the broader uh, umbrella or the wider umbrella I would say that we are looking at or focusing in on. And another thing is that last year we conducted a uh, one day uh, work IPOS Academy workshop in February 2015 on calm skills um, in cancer care again. So um, it's not like you know we haven't been doing psychosocial oncology work in IIT Hyderabad. We've been doing it <clears throat> it's just that perhaps it's um, a lot of people can't seem to associate what, what a technology institute may have to do with um, oncology. But this said, apart from doing um, you know, oncology research, um, we, we also interface a lot with the technology and the innovation team out in IIT Hyderabad. And uh, in the coming uh, weeks um, in this year, you'll see that um, there's some work that we're working, uh, we're exploring um, that interfaces between psychology, oncology, and engineering. Anyway, moving on. 
Now coming to the purpose of this particular workshop on psychological distress and cancer, there were two major motivations towards it. One was um, because, well, IPOS has endorsed uh, distress as a sixth vital sign in June 2009, but also because in our last year's workshop on calm skills, um, a majority of the participants had requested for a workshop on psychological distress in the field. So the goals of this workshop um, were, uh, you know, two. One was uh, to help um, impart uh, techniques on identifying patients and caregivers who were experiencing psychological distress in during the cancer trajectory, and uh, then to provide the uh, appropriate psychological support uh, to these patients and caregivers. The esteemed very experienced faculty that was involved in um, teaching these uh, the workshop were Daisuke Fujisawa who came down from uh, the K University in Tokyo Japan on one of the JICA funding um, opportunities and then there was Samitha Datta who flew in from Tata Medical Center in Kolkata he's a psychiatrist out there so is Daisuke and then there's me from ID Hyderabad and Arthi Selvan who is an expert on mindfulness um, uh, based out here in Hyderabad. The program uh, consisted of um, day one being more focused on techniques of identifying um, psychological distress. So we started off with a very brief overview on psychological distress, which is what the next few slides are going to be about. And then Somita started uh, introduced sessions two and three on key challenges that clinicians experience or face when they're trying to manage psychological distress in patients, but also caregivers. And then on how to identify distress. So what are all the psychological assessments available and how do you make sense of it? Then the day was wrapped up with uh, Daisuke Fujisawa talking about the comprehensive assessment and then uh, doing a group uh, activity where uh, the participants of the workshop were asked to uh, look at a case and provide their brainstorm on the comprehensive assessment sheet and then um, you know present it to the rest of the participants. Day two was super uh, techniques uh, oriented in terms of providing support for patients. So the first half of the day was about the cognitive behavior therapy and cognitive therapy that was uh, again dealt with, uh, with the help of da Daisuke, facilitated rather by with the help of uh, Daisuke Fujisawa. And the second half was about mindfulness uh, facilitated by Arathi. And both these sessions were very, very activity interactive oriented. And and the participants reported and en having enjoyed um, both the days, but particularly the second day because it was so much more hands-on. So here is like a, I you know a typical schedule of what what went into our days um, on day one and day two. And I'd like to add over here that the food was spectacular. So for today's presentation, I'm just going to talk about session one, which was my session on uh, introducing or providing an overview about psychological distress. Um, and I'll be talking about what is psychological distress, when can it occur, and any kind of research related to India. So when you think about cancer, you would identify it as a major health threat, yes? Now, cancer and its treatment does cause a lot of um, issues, but what issues are they? They can be family relationships and dynamics being changed, which can pause an issue. There are issues of quality of life, body image, coping, spiritual, existential, social. Talk about it, and it probably could be an issue that a patient is being faced with. So not only is it a major physical threat, but it is also a spiritual, psychological, emotional, social, personal threat. So in that sense, cancer in itself poses to be a very, um, what do we say, um, a very, uh, oh, I can't believe that I'm losing the word while I'm recording presentation I'm really sorry about this um, but it, it, it comes it, it, it presents itself as a very um, scary threat for the lack of a better adjective this is the one I'm using for now um, but yeah so 
cancer in itself is really scary and therefore the, the opportunities or the potential for it to cause psychological distress are immense. Now psychological distress, what is it? Um, it's been defined or described as a multifaceted unpleasant emotional experience that is of a psychological, social and spiritual nature that can also obstruct one's ability to cope effectively with the health threat and its physical symptoms or its treatment. Now distress can come right across the continuum of any kind of uh, care or issues, uh, right from the feelings of uh, sadness or fear to more complicated, more disabling or limiting conditions like depression, anxiety, existential crisis, and um, which may require some kind of timely intervention. What is important to understand is that distress is a very treatable complication that occurs during a trajectory of a health threat and it can present itself at any stage during that trajectory. The symptoms of distress are many um, and as you can see it can so easily be misunderstood for something that is transient or something that is um, you know what exactly it presents itself as like fear or indecisiveness without realizing the fact that a multiple number of these symptoms could then lead to distress. So I've asked the participants and I would like you to reflect upon when do you think psychological distress can occur in the continuum of cancer care? Right, so you may have rightly guessed this that it can occur during any phase of the, the, the psychological journey that you take during cancer. So right from discovering a suspicious symptom all the way through to end of life or palliation, every step of the journey can be distress provoking. So on a, in, a, in a very interesting, important landmark on, uh, you know, um, paper, Mitchell and colleagues had shown how psychological health can be affected or during the time trajectory of having cancer. And, and as you can see that, you know, there is distress that occurs at the time of cancer diagnosis. So the, there's psychological health and then there is a diagnosis of cancer and psychological health starts plummeting downwards. Now somewhere along this trajectory, there is an upward spike towards growth. There is a, a spike towards recovering and maintaining one's or, you know, initial or before the diagnosis, pre-diagnosis, let's say, psychological well-being. Or there can be impairment or there can be a further slide down towards deterioration. Now what is shocking and scary uh, is that 35 to 40 percent of the population present with either impairment or deterioration or linger somewhere in between. Now that brings us to cancer statistics out in India. As uh, some of you may have known already, the cancer incidence is pretty high in India at, at 1.8 million. We have more than a million new cases every year and an appalling oncologist to patient ratio of 1 is to 2,000 and deaths due to cancer are more than 600,000 per year. On the psychological or the psychosocial aspects of cancer, public perceptions of cancer are that of stigma, taboo and there's a relation to death. So it, it is, it's presenting itself as something that is a life threat where death is you know, imminent. Now the prevalence of psychological distress or cancer related distress among patients is anywhere between 32 to 41 percent and there have been two major studies that have reported these statistics to us and there's been only one study that looked at family caregivers levels of distress and reported that they experience moderate to high levels of distress. Now with all this you know high levels of distress that exist in um, among patients and caregivers um, facing cancer, how many psychologists are there? 15,000. And these are psychologists across any kind of specialty, not spe you know, specific to cancer. 
So <clears throat> this was also one more motivation for us to look at psychological distress as our this year's IPOS Academy workshop, because we were wondering whether we could have, you know, because there is a death for people, then how can we give people, the ones who are already plugged into the system of cancer care, how can we provide them with additional information skills so that they could double up as not only say a social worker but also as a counseling psychologist or a counselor who can deal with psychological distress. So let's look at distress within the culture milieu of India. So um, the first question that I would have asked you is what is distress called in your language? How do you communicate the very word distress? So take a moment and think about the variety of words you would have used to describe distress in your particular language. So there's a likelihood that you would have come up with at least two different ways or two words that would have described distress, right? So what that shows you is that one, that distress as an English word that is used cannot directly translate into an Indian language, any of them. The other thing that it should probably pop up at you is that we describe distress in a variety of ways, in a variety of words. So for us, the major problematic is the fact that we don't even have a word for distress. We have a word for variants of distress for sure, but not for the actual word called distress. So that really opens up an entire avenue of discussion on how can we use the existing standardized scales within an Indian population in a way that actually measures what it's supposed to measure. So how are we back translating, translating, validating, uh, you know, these or testing the efficacy of these measures. And the other thing is, can we develop a measure of our own that is standardized, replicated, and therefore shows validity, contract validity, reliability, consistency. So really that's an entire, as I said, avenue of discussion that really kind of requires us to mull and chew over. But let's move on to thinking about the factors that are associated with distress. So there's been a plethora of research in India that has looked at distress within cancer and looked at the variety of factors that feed into distress or distress is related to. So have a think about it. What do you think gets affected by or is affected with distress? Right, so some of the factors as expected are uh, some demographic factors like uh, lower, in lower income, fem being female, the marital status, so people who are single, widowed and divorced report higher levels of distress, the distance that one has to travel um, from the cancer center to their home and vice versa, the patients who have advanced tumors at presentation, the presence of pain, non-disclosure not being aware of the true cancer diagnosis, so not knowing that these symptoms match a diagnosis of cancer, a poor quality of life, and decreased spiritual well-being. So these are the factors that are <clears throat> known to be associated with distress within the research that emerges from India. Now there have been two studies that have explored screening for distress within an Indian cancer population. One of, us is by, one of it is by Bijori Thomas, um, who used the Distress Inventory for Cancer, the DIC. And what they found from their study was that A, the DIC is suitable for an Indian population, and it was predictive of a negative clinical behavior, which means that it was predictive of non-adherence to treatment and non-adherence or non-compliance to follow-ups. A more recent study by Desai et al used the distress thermometer to screen for distress in, among cancer pop populations in India. Again, they found that the distress thermometer was 
actually pretty suitable for Indian populations. And it also identified the major causes for distress, such as physical issues, practical issues, and emotional issues, which sort of ties in with our previous slide that talked about how there are a lot of demographic issues, but there are also a couple of social issues and certain practical issues, such as you know uh, traveling to and fro, physical issues like the presence of pain, and emotional issues as such as not knowing about cancer, and therefore for presenting with a lot of emotional distress. But a key evidence from this particular paper was that there was a requirement for staff to implement this screening. So it again ties in with the whole um, research on looking at the, the dearth for uh, supporting support care staff within the realm of cancer. And this again points to the fact that yes, while there are screening measures that are suitable for the Indian population, who administers them? And once they're administered, who will take care of the patients who've been flagged as experiencing high levels of distress? So this is one of the major reasons why we decided that it's time to have a workshop on psychological distress and cancer care within an in, with an Indian uh, participant base in order to help with capacity building and skills building. So I had asked my participants, and I ask you too, what do you think should be the research and practice in India in terms of future forward? So what do we need to do in terms of looking at psychological distress and cancer care in terms of research and practice? Well, what I had brainstormed about was that <clears throat> this research and pra clinical practice needs to be more inclusive of children with cancer and childhood cancers, family caregivers who present with high levels of distress, physicians' perspectives on psychological distress, on screening, on implementation of screening programs for it, and also about how do you uh, provide support for patients who experience high levels of distress. So physicians' perspectives on it. <clears throat> Same thing, healthcare staff also plays a big role, so nurses, social workers, um, and then screening for cancer in India. Is it feasible? Is it e efficacious? Skills training for healthcare professionals in terms of identifying and supporting patients who have uh, or caregivers who have high levels of distress. The patient, family member, and physician relationship, because this is a very collectivist con country, right? So we need to look at it in a more holistic fashion. And the role of advocacy and patient education and help seeking. Now, this point really did bring up a lot of discussion during the workshop because a major issue is that when patients experience high levels of distress and if there is a mechanism to identify it either through a screening tool or for physicians who you know flag this as a case that needs to be delved into a little more carefully and if they rep refer this particular person this patient who's suffering from high levels of distress to somebody a mental health care practitioner be it a psychiatrist psychologist social worker counseling psychologist name it then there's an issue of a patient saying, well, I'm not crazy. I don't need this kind of help. So there is an important role for advocacy about being okay about seeking mental health care and to be, it's okay to experience distress because of cancer and improving patient's education in help seeking. So with this part, I, I end up my part of the, the session, which was an introduction to psychological distress. And the second session was on key challenges for clinicians in managing a psychological distress in cancer patients, which was facilitated by Dr. Samitha Datta from TMC Calcutta. And um, so with this, actually I'm done uh, with our uh, talk for today. And um, please stay tuned into this channel. We've got a whole lot of other talks coming up. And um, if you have any comments, queries, questions, as usual, please drop me an email at mahati, M-A-H-A-T-I, at iith.ac.in. Bye for now.